there's nothing nothing more interesting or challenging uh, in, the, in the intellectual world uh, than working at the highest level at which paradigms come into conflict. We all need to do some kind of detailed analytic work at some point just to show that we're honest, you know. I mean, Picasso could draw. You know? So, uh, but it, uh, the, the, the ultimate value and interest and challenge of uh, a work, one of the criteria for assessing that, is the, the degree to which it emerges at the highest levels of you know, possible points of view and uh, uh, the, makes choices and decisions among uh, you know, competing alternatives. So the larger the context, you know, the better. One of the things that literature or literary study has always, at least since the 19th century when it was in conflict with science, has had going for it or uh, has identified itself with was the, the, the notion that the world of the imagination, uh, the world of artistic creativity, everything in the humanities, the whole qualitative sphere of life uh, is different from and superior to uh, ordinary life and to the material and physical things that are studied by science. Uh, the idea is that there's, there's a split between the physical material world and the practical world on the one side and the spiritual and imaginative world on the other side. And, and whether you're a postmodernist or a traditional liberal humanist or whatever you might be, that's one of the most uh, pervasive underlying shared characteristics of of humanistic study. So, so however incompatible each of those aspects might seem with one another, they all converge in a, in a kind of an imaginative uh, mix in the minds of, of humanists to invest them with, with the, this kind of priestly vision of, of their mission in the world. Science didn't have the same kind of claims in, in the universities or in the public consciousness as classical scholarship and as you know, humanistic learning. The genteel educated part of the population were educated in humanistic learning. And then move up to the, the 19th century where science is, is rapidly gaining in prestige and significance and you've got the debate between Arnold and Huxley where Arnold tries to affirm again that literature or literary knowledge or humanistic knowledge is in some way supreme. That it's the ultimate interpretive knowledge that makes sense out of all the detailed technical knowledge that science can provide. There really wasn't an alternative to that in the humanities uh, until postmodernism came along. And what postmodernism did was not to reaffirm the centrality of, of humanistic values that are embodied in canonical literature, but instead to, to shift its focus toward discourse itself, discourse conceived very broadly as all of language, all of culture, uh, all of semiology and signification of any kind, and to argue that, uh, that there is no privileged discourse of science or any other field, that all discourse is merely discourse that obeys the logic of, of or illogic of, of language and rhetoric so that all of a sudden literary people as rhetoricians uh, were, were again the priests with the keys to the kingdom. They're the people who had access to the ultimate stuff that governs all, all meaning. So there's a huge element of uh, sheer egotism, uh, vanity, professional vanity, professional ambition that uh, fuels the, the postmodern movement. theory and, and with a certain intonation there, it's spelt with a capital T. It, it's a whole complex of ideas um, that emerged in the late 1960s through the work of certain French uh, critics, Roland Barthes, uh, Jacques Derrida and Michel Foucault especially, um, that became known as, well, first post-structuralism and then, uh, well, it was called either just, just theory or uh, post-structural, um, post-modernist theory, um, but, but theory was a name that, that particularly took off and, and that it particularly annoys those of us who don't sus subscribe to it because it, it implies that it's a, a kind of fundamental critique of everything else that has ever been thought and uh, that seems, uh, well, <laughs> it's, it's not a very good critique. We can make much better critiques of, of certain assumptions in Western philosophy, I think from an evolutionary perspective, much more, much deeper ones and, and less flimsy uh, than, uh, than theory does. 
if you think about what the big ideas were in literary theory over the f last 50 years, also off the top of my head, things like uh, the death of the author, um, the, uh, you know, the Freudian um, and, and other forms of psychoanalysis, um, the blank slate theory, which is this idea that human nature is basically unconstrained by biology. And that was the bottom layer of bedrock in almost all literary theory over the last 20 or 30 years was that, that, that humans are unconstrained, culture is everything, context is everything, nature is nothing. And so, what you f so, so all those ideas were just kind of wrong. And that has been the history of the field, that the, that, the, that the ideas of one generation of literary scholars can rarely survive the critique of the next generation of literary scholars. And it's a very different model than what, than what you find in the sciences, where again, in the sciences, they're mostly wrong too. But there is also this slowly, uh, slow accretion of information, knowledge, concepts that, uh, that most reasonable people have to admit um, are, are, are probably true. And so my hope is that, by, that we can retain the best aspects of, of our traditional modes and supplement them with new tools uh, from the sciences. Evolutionary psychology, as a, as, a, as a kind of an umbrella term, not narrow school EP, but evolutionary social science, uh, provides the information that we need about, uh, about human nature, about the evolved dispositions, you know, motives, uh, basic emotions, uh, uh, mate selection strategies, personality, uh, the larger structure of the life cycle. Um, uh, that kind of information we've always had in in literary study, uh, uh, just from the common language and common knowledge, the term human nature has always been a, a kind of a key term in literary theory from Aristotle up to uh, the early 20th century. And people were drawing on a you know folk understanding of human nature, which is rich and diverse, but it's also diffuse and you know opened all kinds of uh, uh, biases and distortions, and, and in literary study particularly, it's the, what we've had over the past, I guess, uh, 100 years, say, has been a, uh, a combination of folk ideas of human nature and uh, all kinds of uh, half-assimilated, half-baked uh, uh, speculative theories about human nature in, in various fields like uh, psychoanalysis and Marxist sociology and feminist ideology and deconstructive linguistics. and That's what we've had to work with and it's not good. I mean, it really hasn't worked very well at all. Um, there's been you know, vast amounts written uh, in, in literary study and, and it displays uh, all the virtuosity that uh, highly intelligent and cultivated educated people can bring to bear using that toolkit. But the toolkit itself uh, has led us into uh, 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 systematic forms of uh, folly, of uh, uh, you know, perversity, of uh, 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 willful, uh, willful departures from uh, the truth and reality. And that was where I came in, you know, in, in the early 90s. That's we said everything that everybody's doing in literary study. In a, in, in, a, in a broad way, it seems to me fundamentally wrong. They're denying the reality of individual persons. Uh, they're talking about textuality and sort of the circulation of cultural energies. Uh, they're, they're talking about the primacy, the total overwhelming primacy of language. None of that's true. It can't possibly be true. It's all ideologically charged in distorting ways. Uh, I need something more wholesome, more adequate, more coherent, uh, closer to the truth. You know, and and then I went and read Darwin and. And I had a uh, sort of a cleansing vision of deep time, uh, you know, humans emerging out of millions of years of evolution. It just cut through all of the sort of uh, the the uh, intellectual confusion at superficial levels that prevailed in literary study. So I set about trying to reconstruct literary study using, you know, working from the ground up, uh, uh, using evolutionary. Uh, using an evolutionary vision of uh, human nature as the, the basis for uh, reconstructing all the concepts that we need to understand literature. And